This is the Palace of the Parliament. 270 by 240 meters, it is one of the largest buildings on the planet, and it's probably the heaviest. However, this concrete giant is small compared with the master plan that created it. In the late 1970s, Romania's communist leader decided he wanted something new, a socialist capital that centralized his country's political institutions and cemented his reign. Over the course of a decade, Nicolae Ceausescu set in motion one of the most destructive master plans in human history, removing a section of Bucharest as large as Venice. Romania is special. Located on the eastern end of the European continent, it's home to one of the most seismically active areas in Europe. The Francian mountain range within the Carpathians produces unusually strong earthquakes. And on March 4, 1977, Francia produced an earthquake measuring more than seven on the Richter scale. In Bucharest, it killed more than 1,500 Romanians, destroyed thousands of homes, and left tens of thousands homeless. For some Romanians, it was one of the worst disasters in their lives. But for one Romanian, it was a blessing in disguise. On the pretense of responding to the destruction of the earthquake, Nicolae Ceausescu announced that the country needed to build a new capital in Bucharest city center. His plan was designed around three main sections. One, the Casa Populuri, a massive structure designed to hold Romania's main political organs. Two, a horizontal axis of administrative buildings for the bureaucrats and three, a massive boulevard lined with luxury apartments for the nomenclatura, Romania's political elite. For his massive building, Ceausescu needed to scope out a safer location. Some of Romania's communist political institutions were damaged in the earthquake, and this couldn't happen again. So he chose Arsenal Hill, a mountain in the center of Bucharest that provided protection from earthquakes. However, there was a problem. Because the hill was safe, it still had an entirely intact neighborhood. Actually, this wouldn't be a problem for Ceausescu at all. He'd just destroy it. It was only a problem for the people living there. In the mid to early 1970s, Romania's Communist Party adopted multiple national systematization laws. The fundamental goal was to develop backwards regions and prioritize dense urban areas over rural ones. To do this, the party ordered villages to be converted into miniature cities with civic centers, functional zoning, and high-density buildings. At face value, it didn't seem entirely bad. Density can be good. But Romania's communists were impatient. By the mid-1980s, the party proposed that thousands of villages in Romania had to be entirely demolished and the population relocated to different villages in order to produce denser, more productive areas. Fortunately for many, this didn't end up happening. Romanians chose revolution over central planning. But the individual neighborhoods in Bucharest weren't as lucky. Ceausescu ordered the destruction of more than 10,000 homes and forcibly evicted more than 50,000 families. With a new blank canvas, he could start building. He launched a competition and received multiple designs. A big fan of North Korea, one of the concepts he received looks like it came straight out of Pyongyang. Made by the 20-something-year-old architect, Anka Petrescu, she purposely built large papier-mâché models to help convince Ceausescu to choose her designs. And it worked. Although her North Korean design wasn't chosen, she proposed another variation that did. Considerably thinner than what we know the building as today, it still featured its unique four corners. Nonetheless, it's hard not to notice how different it still looks. See, exactly what you'd expect from a communist central planner, Ceausescu was a control freak who wasn't very easy to please. He and his equally controlling wife would visit the building's construction site around three times a week. They wanted the columns to be Doric, Ionic, and then Doric again. Windows that were round now needed to be square. He needed one more floor, then another one and then another one. He destroyed marble staircases, ordered them rebuilt, ordered them destroyed again, and then ordered them rebuilt again. It had no air conditioning, specifically because Ceausescu feared a poison attack, and he would order people to measure flowers on decorating columns in order to make sure that they were symmetrical. Over the course of the building's construction, it would take up around 30% of the entire country's budget. 
and overseeing the entire construction and reconstruction was Anka, the chief architect, who underneath her had 700 other individual architects and thousands of workers working in three shifts 24-7. Because Ceausescu was a man of the Romanian people, he ordered that the entire building should be locally sourced from Romanian materials. His palace required around 1 million cubic meters of marble, 550,000 tons of cement, 700,000 tons of steel, 2 million tons of sand, 900,000 cubic meters of wood, 3,500 tons of crystal, 220,000 square meters of carpet, and 3,500 square meters of leather. Ceausescu and his communist cronies created an entire crystal industry in Romania to help build thousands of individual chandeliers. While he organized a political apparatus that scanned the streets to catch and punish families who used more than one 40-watt light bulb, his palace was rigged with tens of thousands. While he cut central heating and hot water from Romanian households, he commanded the construction of a building that today requires the same amount of power as a mid-sized town. His building is made up of more than 1,000 individual rooms and has 14 floors, 10 above ground and 4 beneath. The building is also supposedly fitted with an atomic bunker and a tunnel system that could have secured an escape in case of the need for an evacuation. Unfortunately for Ceausescu and his wife, their tunnels wouldn't be useful enough in time. Now that he had a design for his building, Ceausescu also needed an equally monumental axis. Called the Victory of Socialism Boulevard, it would purposely be made longer than the Champs Elysees, around 3.5 kilometers in length and 90 meters wide. Lining his boulevard are 10-story apartment buildings that were intended for key members of his party. From a distance, his boulevard seems like it completely disregards the native conditions of the city, as though the buildings were just glued on. And that's because they were. Eugenio Iordicescu was a Romanian also known as the Engineer of Heaven. Concerned about the planned communist destruction, he developed a system to move churches and historical buildings on rails. This allowed him and others to save historical buildings that would have otherwise stood in the way of Ceausescu's grand plans. The last part of Ceausescu's plan were the administrative buildings surrounding the Piata Constitui, a massive semicircle where Ceausescu was supposed to address his people. Unfortunately for Nicolae, though, the building would not be completed in time for him to use it. Instead, Romanians grew restless and they'd end Ceausescu's reign. Both him and his wife were sentenced to death in a brief military show trial and executed via firing squad. After his death, Ceausescu's palace remained unfinished and it was unclear what to do with it. There were those who suggested that it should be demolished. It was the purest symbol of communism and Ceausescu's cult of personality. And there were also ideas to convert it into the world's largest shopping mall, casino, and even into a Dracula theme park. It could have also been densified, but instead it was chosen to become the home of Romania's government. Today, it houses both Romania's Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. It is the biggest parliament building on the planet and the second largest administrative building, second only to the Pentagon. The horizontal axis is still used by ministries and the square is now used for concert venues. The boulevard is also still there, of course, but instead of apartments being filled with members of the nomenclatura, they are some of Bucharest's most valuable apartments. Although Ceausescu's plans have now become integrated and over time have developed a practical political function, it should never be forgotten what this building is. It is Europe's largest and youngest symbol for centralized control and authoritarian communism. A constant reminder of how real it is to be led by people who live and breathe, do as I say, not as I do. This is your life in weeks, if you're lucky enough to turn 80 years old. Each week, a cube disappears, taking away a piece of your life that you'll never get back. At first, you may not care, especially when you have cubes to spare. But as you get older, it becomes clearer. We know that our time binging TV shows, getting angry and regretful, requires a cost. Each cube given is one that you'll never get back. And there's probably no larger cube consumer than the job you choose to dedicate your life to. 80,000 hours is the amount of time you'll spend in a career, and it's also the name of the nonprofit that wants to help you find a meaningful one. 
If your cubes have to go, why not give them to a career that impacts something you care about? The choice of a career is a hard one, but 80,000 Hours is here to help you. They've been researching the question for how you can find a fulfilling career that also does good for years. They have a website that provides you their research, a podcast, and also a newsletter. They have a job board that provides hundreds of open listings for potential high-impact career paths, and all of their advice and research is free, forever. So if you're not sure what you should do with your cubes, or you're worried about how you're spending them, maybe check out their in-depth career guide at 80,000hours.org slash hoch. Remember, life is short, but what you do with your decreasing time is up to you.